All right, hello everybody. Um, my name is Julie Bush. Uh, I work at Condé Nast in New York. There we go. Okay, so I work at Condé Nast in New York. It's right there. And um, we're going to put this on hold for just a sec because before we get to business, I have been advised to be relatable. And so I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself. Um, so, I actually don't come from a traditional computer science background. Um, I used to be a stage manager for theater. Um, I'm pretty new to this game. I've been working uh, for a little over a year and a half in the industry. Um, to be very reductive about what a stage manager is, just so that you understand the context, um, during the rehearsal process, uh, the actors and the director are focusing on the artistic development of a piece and the stage manager is figuring out what needs to be done to make all of those things happen in real life and communicating with the necessary departments and people and so on. Um, so I was drawn to coding because it has many parallels with the organizational, analytical, and problem-solving skills required in stage management, and also because both fields are highly collaborative. And um, I'm not a loner, so you know I enjoy working with other people and um, coming together to make cool stuff. Um, lastly, I'm also a very long game kind of person, so I've always enjoyed being in a position to watch the evolution of a product over time. Um, it's just as interesting to watch the process uh, for me as it is uh, to have a final product. Uh, and so now, perhaps you'll have uh, some understanding behind what my talk is focusing on today. Uh, so now that you can relate to me, I am going to go ahead and get started with creative collaboration, building a unified design system. So we left off here, um, Condé Nast, New York. Um, as was mentioned, uh, Condé Nast has a lot of different brands, um, many disparate types and topics. And um, the way that things used to be back in the days of yore um, was that every different brand had its own team of engineers and its own code base for its website. And of course this seemed sensible because um, this is a company that started in print publishing um, over 100 years ago and so the way that the magazines work is that they each have their own separate team. So as digital started to be integrated into the company, you just add people to each of those teams and you know carry on. Um, but consider that despite the very distinct uh, tones, designs, and topics of each of the brands, their digital needs are actually overwhelmingly similar. Um, for example, uh, some shared site needs include uh, the ability to show aggregated content, um, which is to say something like a home page or a page showing content um, by author, by, um, by subject. Uh, you also need to be able to show the actual content itself when someone chooses an article to read or a gallery to look at. And that is pretty much it. That's what we, what we do. That's content. And you just need to be able to view it. That's a website for us, for the most part. So um, with that being the case, uh, having separate teams for all of the different websites uh, started to make less and less sense because with the sites being as similar as they are in terms of what they need, um, it would make sense that any feature that works well on one site would work well on another, and we would want to pass it along. Uh, so I don't need to go too much into explaining uh, how that's not really efficient in order to get one feature onto every different brand by having it passed from brand to brand uh, with dev time in between and so on. Uh, so we decided that was enough of that and we set forth a plan uh, to create a single application that would host all of our sites. Um, we'd have a library of shared components uh, built in React, and these components would not just be the visual aspects of uh, the designs, but they would really be like truly plug and play pieces of a website. Like you put in a newsletter sign-up form, you pop it in there, and you have a newsletter sign-up form, it's connected to the API, everything works, people can use it immediately as, once, as soon as it's live. 
Um, and so uh, that's, that's our lofty goal, uh, to increase our efficiency, to reduce redundancy, and uh, to really be able to move a lot more quickly in terms of developing products that will help us um, stay innovative and ahead in the media industry. So this application, which we um, lovingly dubbed Verso, was uh, what we set out to do. Um, a little bit uh, before the end of last year, we started making the server. We, um, we moved to working on front-end stuff uh, near the beginning of this year. And so, um, just for clarity's sake, in case you were wondering, this is the deal. Um, if you want a feature to be given to many different brands, um, all we want to be able to do is develop it one time, hence one clock, in Verso and then it'll automatically be available to any brand that is hosted therein. And uh, we had a few requirements around how we wanted to implement this um, because, you know, without some limitations, it could very easily be messy. Uh, so one thing was that we decided that we would have no brand-specific code. Um, reusability was going to be the key in terms of everything we did. Um, because if we want to um, add features, they need to be able to be popped into any given brand site and um, working immediately. So no brand specific code. Another is that we needed to make it scalable because uh, Condé Nast has over 20 brands right now. We need to support all of those, but also we need to support any number of brands that they may choose to add in the future. Uh, and it should be just as easy for our application to support 40 brands as it is for it to support two. And lastly, we really needed to get it done as fast as possible. Um, that is because I think that the, uh, you know, the business advantage here is clear in terms of restructuring the team and you know, how the websites work, and also because we don't want to have to support both legacy websites and this new app uh, concurrently for too long of a time. And um, perhaps most importantly, because you can't go to a brand and say, hey, we figured out a way to make a really cool application that's gonna be really great for everyone and everything, and um, we're gonna stop working on what you've got going on right now so we can work on that and we'll be done in five years. Okay, bye. So. Um, with that being the case, uh, time was of the essence. So really, how? Um, how indeed, Mr. Wahlberg. Uh, JSON. JSON is perhaps not the, um, not what you would expect uh, for an answer to this question, and you probably also wouldn't expect it to have exclamation points like that, because I feel like it's not typically so exciting. Um, but here, it is. Uh, the, the main way that we were going to pull off this system was by having every brand based in a configuration. In that way, we would be able to not have any unique logic written within our uh, components and still have all of the brands maintain their you know, unique uh, visual appearance. Because, um, you know, the differences need to live somewhere, otherwise you've made a lot of people really angry and you've just made one website. Uh, so how does that work in terms of the, like, what does this configuration file look like? So this is an example um, of how we started going about with uh, here colors one of the many, many things that need to be uniquely adjusted for every brand. Uh, so you'll see that we have um, these different key value pairs, and these are referred to as design tokens. Um, the design token uh, just being the name of the unique bit that is being used as the dynamic element of um, a certain website that gets changed on a brand by brand basis. Uh, so here, um, our palette has different uh, color values, and then we have different use cases where we were uh, creating tokens that were semantically named, um, but still de decoupled from their usage, again, for reusability. We didn't want to name something, um, you know, footer link, because theoretically, that everything should be somewhat consistent, and you might want to use that link token again elsewhere. That's not a footer. And 
you know, you don't want to confuse people. So, JK. So, um, how does that actually become styles? Uh, what we did was set up our JSON to be loaded into our styles, uh, which we were writing in SAS, as a map. And then uh, from there, we can do things like make this uh, nifty function you see at the bottom that just references the map uh, to get a color value. And then you can use that function uh, like so in the SAS. And without having written anything brand specific within your styles, you're getting brand specific values based on what your domain is. Also how is atomic design. Um, you may have heard of atomic design. If not, it is essentially just a way of sorting things from the smallest, most indivisible pieces and combining them into larger pieces. And this was against a way that we chose to do things for the sake of reusability. Um, we actually uh, hired Brad Frost, who wrote the book Atomic Design, and who is the source of this image, um, as a consultant on this project. And he did say that while um, he has a ton of experience making design systems for individual brands, what we were really doing was making a design system of design systems, and he didn't really know how it was gonna work. So we were going into uncharted territory here. And so without really a um, case study to go off of in terms of uh, workflow and such, uh, we set out with our initial process in the way that we thought was best to get started, which was to reverse engineer the design system from the existing brand designs. Because we did um, want to give the brands some assurance that they would not be losing a lot of their uniqueness in this changeover, that we wouldn't be just producing cookie cutter websites that just you know, change the logo at the top or something. Everyone was very concerned about maintaining their design integrity. And um, so it made sense for us to start with the original designs in order to maintain that. So we would get design specs um, as usual um, with just an image of a page make this thing, have it look like this, have it work, there you go. And it would be up to the engineers to actually find and um, separate out the different components that would be uh, part of the atomic model, and also to decide how to make those uh, different dynamic elements between brands into tokens that would then be part of this JSON configuration. Uh, getting started, uh, we went with two of the more minimally designed brands um, and chose them for the pilot run of a template. In this case here was the contributor page. So you'll see we started with Golf Digest and Self, um, which are somewhat similar. A uh, few things differing, mainly the shape of the images. Uh, that's you know the most distinct thing. A couple of quirky nav decorations at the top there. And uh, in order to get this app running, we decided to go with two to start with and then add the rest of the brands in in stages. So we were going for a process that we intended to be very iterative. So we started with the first two brands, um, very similar here and here, built an app, and then would loop in another brand that's a little more um, complex and another brand and so on. And our theory was that eventually, once we had gotten all of the brands supported in our application, we would be able to support any other design that came our way. We would have all of the knobs and switches needed, and everyone would live happily ever after. Um, that didn't happen right away. Uh, so there were uh, some things that we found in this approach that were not ideal. Uh, first of all, I did mention the speed thing, where uh, it was of the essence to get this project done as quickly as possible. And with the setup that we had, multiple engineering teams couldn't work concurrently because merging without conflicts was essentially impossible. Um, that is because with the JSON 
configuration with it being up to the developers to decide exactly how to abstract different parts of a visual design into a purely data-based uh, form was um, not, not only difficult, more difficult than you might think uh, in terms of making it make sense and having it be semantic and reusable, uh, but people would make different decisions that would cover different things, thinking that they were different things, but they weren't. For example, people would be working on the contributor page. You might set up the configuration in a certain shape to cover a certain piece of the design, such as, let's say, the difference between the image shapes. And another team working on, say, an article page would set up a shape of a JSON config, and it would be made to adjust the image shapes. And not only would those think pieces of code conflict, but they're duplicates of each other, and so we can't just have 17 ways of doing everything in this file. And so then we would have to sync up on it and decide which approach to take. Um, that brings us to another finding, which was that we were having constant meetings. Um, in order to try to keep everybody on sync with this project, it was, there were almost more meetings in a day than there was time to code, really, because it's just not really feasible to keep a multitude of teams, or even just a few teams. It's very hard to keep people synced um, to the moment on a line-by-line -line basis in a gigantic JSON configuration file and know that nobody is stepping on anybody else's toes, that nobody is duplicating anybody else's work. So the constant meetings were a very valiant effort, I will say, to end that, but there just aren't enough hours in the day. And lastly, it was hard to create a system with these problems because with the ensuing chaos, that, that's just not a system if you have all sorts of ways of doing things just looped in there ad hoc. So with this information, uh, we decided to completely uh, turn around the approach we were taking to building this application and focus first and foremost on the system itself, not the end product that we were trying to achieve, but the pieces that would become the end product. So uh, in this case, I think of it as making the bricks before the house, whereas before the house was coming first and bricks were being pulled from the house magically, except not because magic's not real and neither was the way that working on that project was going. Um, so the designers actually needed to get a lot more involved in the implementation. Usually, as I mentioned, they hand off a design a nice, you know, flashy, finished product, and it doesn't matter how you make it happen, as long as it happens. And in this case, we found that design needed to be the first people thinking about how to make it happen. So that rather than having all of the engineers deciding um, on a day-by-day -day basis, just as they were going through tickets, what to turn into a token, what not to, how to structure that JSON naming and so forth, the tokens were determined by the designers up front. So we started getting specs like these that were much more technical, where this is also, you'll notice, not a brand, but just a general brandless template. And the designers set it up so that they could decide all of the things that they felt they needed to achieve the unique designs of all the brands and labeled them up front and decided how they wanted to structure it in a way that made sense to them, since they're the ones ultimately assigning these tokens to their designs when they create them, and then handing it over to us where we would just need to make this completely brand agnostic, entirely reusable template, and fill in the blanks when it came to what parts of the template were uh, dynamic. Um, this is a little bit more of a detailed view of that spec, just in case you wanted to take a look. You can see that each of the blue circles on the top part are numbers labeling the different things that a designer wants to be able to control on a um, brand basis. And then they've helpfully listed out all of the things 
just like a blueprint. So we also had to end the merge conflict madness, which wasn't going to stop just because the tokens were handed over to designers for their ideation. Um, with the JSON going directly into component styles as people were working on uh, those new specs that I mentioned, there was still the high potential for chaos and despair. So in order to rectify that situation, we decided to actually put the JSON configurations in the hands of a single team who would be the gatekeepers and set up a layer of abstraction between the JSON and the component styles that would allow developers to make the component styles safely, in peace. And so we called it our SAS API because it was a layer that we created within the SAS itself in order to isolate the JSON from just the everyday developer making patterns. So the SAS API starts out with the same sort of JSON as we looked at before. And rather than going directly into a function that gets used to set a style as we saw, we first create a variable that's using that same function we were using before, and it has the information needed for the token that it represents. So we made a one variable, in this case, per color token. We made mix-ins for the typography and took every token that design handed to us and made some sort of SAS mix-in or variable to cover it. And in this way, any developer working on one of the components would just have to use the variable in order to style it. And that was then safe because should the structure of the JSON change, which it was likely to do, um, or if anything went wrong or broke, anything behind the SAS API could happen without us needing to update every single instance in which a token was used across numerous components. All we needed to do was update the definition of its representation in the SAS API and then everything would be good again. Uh, further, we worked on automating the creation of these JSON files. Um, one of the JSON files, I would say one of the smaller ones, is about 1,300 lines. It just goes up from there. And you probably just don't want to hand copy that. So this is an example of the way that the designers in this uh, new way of doing things started creating their sketch files for the brands themselves, making tables of all of the different values that they wanted for the different tokens that would end up creating unique results within our application. And as I said, it's just not practical in any way for us to be adding brands by manually coding this into a configuration. So the designers and an engineer worked together to actually create a sketch plugin written in CocoScript that would scrape the files, which the designers uh, normalized for us so that there would be a predictable output. And this little button here produces a JSON file in a minute. Less than a minute, I mean, it's a computer. So this is a big game changer in terms of moving forward, just setting up brands, adding to our application. So the results. Um, as I said, multiple engineering teams were able to work concurrently on components after these changes. That's because with the SAS API and without um, tens of hands mucking around in the JSON, everyone was able to work on separate templates, um, an article, a gallery, whatever they needed, without, being, without having to interfere with anybody else's work. And that gave teams a lot more autonomy as well, because they didn't need to have several meetings with other teams in order to come to an agreement on how they were going to do things. The way that things were going to be done was being determined higher up than that. Uh, further, the design system actually became a system. So instead of it being uh, just drawn from visual designs by engineers, uh, the designers creating it really took it and made it what they needed it to be. 
And lastly, which was the ultimate goal of Verso, pages are able to be created and used by all brands immediately. Because before, we were going to add brands one at a time so that our app would only support what we had already woven into that sort of diagram there. Um, now, with brand agnostic components, Anytime a brand is added via config to the app, it automatically has access to everything within the app, any feature it wants or needs. And that wouldn't be possible if we hadn't switched the way that we start working from design first to bricks and pieces first. So that's what we did. And we continue to do that. Uh, we are actually in the process of cutting over brands from their legacy applications to Verso, little by little. Uh, we have some brands at 100% of traffic going to Verso, depending on the uh, content type. And we just keep on adding and adding to them. And someday, all of our pages will be coming from Verso, each and every one. And the prophecy will be fulfilled. So thank you very much. I'm Julie Bush. I'm a curmudgeon, so I only uh, participate in LinkedIn. You will not find me on Twitter or elsewhere. If you want to friend me, or I guess in this case, it would be colleaguing me, uh, leave a little note, because otherwise I'll think you're spam. So uh, I appreciate your attention, and uh, excellent. Let's have a good afternoon.